welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversations. It's a pleasure, a great distinct pleasure. Welcome to the program, Kostas Panayotakis. He's a, uh, he's a PhD and he's a professor of sociology at the New York College of uh, Technology. He's written a book, I think he's called it Redefine, what is it, Scarcity? Remaking Scarcity. Remaking Scarcity, which is a very, very interesting title. He was one of the speakers on a panel that had been organized by, uh, by uh, Richard Wolff, who's emerging as a major figure in terms of understanding economics in a, in a very interesting and important way. Uh, at the Left Forum, just uh, last week that was held, we met there, and uh, welcome so very, very much, Costas, to Manhattan Network and Conversations. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Very well said. Very well said. Okay, thank you. I wonder if you could share with us, uh, uh, just as a way to wait in, where you were born and raised, in some of your education, and then we want to get talking about the human condition in as comprehensive as we possibly can get without losing the important details of what makes up that comprehensive pattern in terms of the human condition within this universe at this particular moment. But could you share where you were born and raised and educated as a way of wading in, please? Yeah, I was uh, born and raised in uh, Athens, Greece. Mm -hmm. I finished uh, high school there, and I came to the United States for my uh, university studies. I was in, um, uh, I did uh, my bachelor's degree in economics at Stanford University in California. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in 1993, I came to New York City where I did the PhD in sociology at CUNY Graduate Center. I see. Did you study with, uh, at you, it was a, uh, Stanford's a major school on the West Coast. Did you study with any particular people or you were at the bachelor level? Were you yeah. there like you do with a master's program study or a PhD with some individual or not? Or is well, not really. I mean, uh, yeah. it was uh, yeah, it was a bachelor's degree. Yeah, right. It was uh. my introduction to the discipline of economics. It turned out to be different from what I expected, and that's partly this kind of experience with economics kind of motivates my book that you mentioned. Since my book is a critique of mainstream economics, uh -huh, uh -huh. and. Uh, Mainstream economics, the way it is usually taught in the Uni United States and increasingly around the world, uh, is um, has a, a view of uh, economic life that mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, separates economic life from other spheres of social life, which was one of the things that was disappointing to me. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other problem with economics is that it is dominated by one um, particular sort of theoretical tradition, the neoclassical economics, mm -hmm. which um, is quite conservative in terms of political outlook. Uh, it tends to argue that um, markets uh, are the best way to organize economic life. Mm -hmm. So in the course of my college studies, mm -hmm. I, was, I became um, interested in um, political theory. I was interested in more sort of alternative radical perspectives. And since economics did not seem as the uh, discipline that was conducive to an alternative outlook, mm -hmm. I switched to sociology. I see. Um, and I wasn't as aware at the time that yeah. there are alternative economists like right. Richard right. Wolff. Yeah, right. But um, in the U.S., uh -huh. this while in other disciplines like sociology you have a diversity of traditions yeah. you can it's common to have marxists and feminists and so on and so forth uh, economics in a way is kind of more of a totalitarian uh, you think so, yeah. uh -huh. discipline yeah. because mm -hmm. it is dominated by this one tradition uh -huh. and uh, although the alternative economists yeah. they tend to be much more marginalized uh -huh. so you know, I could finish economics and I wasn't even aware of the fact that there were alternative economists. There were people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. in the that U.S. And that's but why, I mean, yeah, I was yeah. sort of prematurely disappointed by the discipline. Yes, right, I understand. Because I wasn't exposed. Right, to. right, right, I understand. Uh, well, maybe we back up to Greece, your family. Was the family setting that you were raised in, that I think it's important, was it warm and welcoming, intellectually stimulating and so forth? And did you get some sort of a sense that took you to Stanford in economics from your earlier training or experience in Greece as you came. You know, why economics, why not sociology at the outset or music or something else? I mean, or, but the family setting maybe. 
Yeah, I guess uh, my parents were, my, my father was an accountant, my mother worked for a bank, so perhaps uh, that kind of make it, made it natural for me to study economics since mm. it seemed to be related. Mm. Uh, perhaps some of my experiences growing up in Greece, uh, for example, I remember vividly when I was 10 years old for the first time, the socialists in Greece yeah. got elected up to that point it was always the right wing in yeah. power and uh -huh. this um, event at the time created a lot of hope yeah which of course has been was disappointed later on yeah uh -huh. uh, since uh, you know the socialists moved way to the right they, they are a force of neoliberalism they help implement very brutal neoliberal policies nowadays notably you know after the current crisis but um, you had a military dictatorship for a while. You know, yeah, I mean... That I was before your time, maybe. Or well, maybe. I guess I, w w I was born during the military yeah. dictatorship, yeah, but uh -huh. uh, the military dictatorship came to an end in yeah. 74 when right. I was three years old. Yeah, so. right, 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 right. And then, you, and then you got into the economics thing and everything like that. You say it's the neoclassical, but um, we have had these different traditions. I don't know the economic... The, 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 the discipline of economics is attributed to, in many people in academia and so forth, to, uh, you know, Adam Smith, the Wealth of Nations, 1776, the steam engine, that sort of thing. And then there were different uh, uh, patterns that developed after that. So it, neoclassical is one, but you had, you had Ricardo and you had, you, you would study all that, Ricardo and, 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 and I don't know if you get to uh, Schumpeter and Van Hayek and that, those are things, or, uh, or you had Keynes, uh, Lord Keynes, who was very, very prominent. Uh, so there were these differentiations that existed within the economic discipline other than just, it didn't come full tilt neoclassical, or define the neoclassical you say is so important, what does it include? And in terms of the the, aber the the development of the discipline of understanding economics, because it's so important. It seems to me economics and politics are joined at the hip. It's very important. We have an understanding of the evolution, not to mention Karl Marx and that, you know. If you understand what I'm trying to get at. You study yeah. the whole canon, as it were. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that was part of the problem. Uh, I wish that the way economics was taught in the U.S. involved teach, uh, sort of studying all these major figures. So yeah. when I studied economics, we didn't study Marx, which I think was a problem. You didn't? It, no, we no, didn't. Okay. They, uh, that's one of the, pr the problems. That's, no, what, yeah, I mean yeah. oh, I I, right that's what I mean when I say yeah. that the way economics is taught in the uh, U.S., oh, uh, okay. it's sort of, uh, it's kind of totalitarian because you have one theoretical tradition mm -hmm. and this one theoretical tradition is not presented as one of the many traditions, one of the many different ways you can approach the analysis of economic life. Mm -hmm. it, is it is taught as the discipline of economics. Really? That's yes, yes. That so it seems very, very blinkered in my way of thinking particularly the people who are at Stanford who are bright. I mean, they got the ability to think, and they got the ability to read something increasingly off the internet and do things like that and be aware of a larger reality that's being ignored by the discipline, and it could be brought up in the class or in a seminar or something. It seems to me, if you understand what I'm yeah, saying, I didn't uh, know that it was so, yeah. you understand? Well, I mean, I had the experience as an undergraduate, yeah. as I was going through the economics uh, yeah. program, I did have, um, an advisor, every undergraduate yeah, had right. an advisor. That's a hell of a good yeah. school. As I yeah, 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 and I mean, the some of the, some of the uh, great yeah. economists were there at yeah. the time, mm -hmm. like Kenneth Arrow, one of the great yeah, economists right. of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Joseph Stiglitz was uh, there at the time. He was, okay. But, yeah. um, I mean, I, I remember, you know, being um, at the, um, talking to my advisor at the time, and he was sort of, could see that I was, starting to be uncomfortable or, or sort of, um, I, I couldn't sort of um, perhaps uh, uh, articulate it clearly yeah, yeah, that right, was right, my yeah. discomfort was, yeah. but it was a kind of incipient discomfort yes. with the fact that economics, the economics I was being taught did not seem to um, 
provide the mm -hmm. kind of um, uh, guidance that I was hoping to yeah, find. Yeah, right. In no, I understand. Yeah, I and feel like uh, that about the universe now. Yeah, yeah and yeah. and I was also starting to develop more critical perspectives you that went against the neoclassical way uh -huh. of uh, looking at uh, economic life. Uh -huh. And I remember he sort of sternly warned me that, you know, <laughs> well, we, you know, we have a Marxist economist in the faculty uh -huh. here at Stanford, but, well, you know, uh -huh. nobody, mm -hmm. nobody really takes care of him, uh, it takes, right. uh, takes him seriously. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was like a sort of, uh, he was sort of warning me yeah. that, you know, if you go in that direction, you know, you're sort of, it's probably not a good idea. Yeah, so yeah. No, no good job opportunities there, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So it was much of that going on in academia, I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, you know, one of the, uh, there was, uh, um, I was, uh, since you mentioned Richard Wolff, I was, mm. I took a class with him at the Brecht Forum, which was a great institution. And they closed down. I was so yeah, sorry I'm to see that. That was yeah. unfortunate. And I think Pacific is under stress. You know, the radio network. Right. Joe right. Hill yeah, started. Yeah. I think they're yeah. under economic stress, yeah. too, which is yeah. very, yeah. The, the venues are changing, yeah, yeah. I mean, are, are closing out that we've had right, for right. expressing something different, yeah. Right. yeah. And, uh, you know, in one of the readings he assigned for that, uh, that class was um, uh, an article by a prominent neoclassical economist who wrote the dictionary entry for neoclassical economics, yeah. and he basically said that, uh, he was saying in that article that any faculty member who veers from the neoclassical perspective is seen as a flat earth advocate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is right. the, this yeah. is the, what yeah. I'm talking about. And they ask you to put on blinkers like a yeah, horse yeah. going down and the And you road. know, the yeah. irony yeah. of course is, mm -hmm. the irony of course is about for neoclassical economists yeah. of all people yeah. to have this sort of totalitarian attitude is that the, the, the whole basis of neoclassical economics, the, the, the whole reason they like yeah. and they praise capitalism mm. and the markets yeah. is because they value choice. Yeah. So yeah. they, they right. sort of talk about, <laughs> so they're sort of excited <laughs> about having, you know, it's important, no choice. <laughs> it's important to have a choice of 50 different detergents yeah. in the supermarket, yeah, right. but, not but, really but when it comes to the ideas, you don't want that. Yeah, I it's understand. There yeah, is a right. sort of an let element of hypocrisy. Okay, let me get it straight. What year were you there at Stanford? What year are you? I'm just trying to think. Um, uh, well, I Mr. started. Is Reagan still there? In the well, or, or, or what? I. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Set the pace. Set the tone. Yeah, I started in 89, so the year the Berlin Wall fell. Oh, wow. So I was oh, there in 1990, 1993. Uh, so, oh. you know, yeah. when neoliberalism was yeah. all the rage. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah. But, uh, yeah, okay, so that was it, and like that. So anyway, so then you, you decided you wanted to get into something a little bit more encompassing uh, uh, in terms of thinking, and so you went towards sociology, right? Right. Okay. And it was a big change because, you know, when you study sociology the first uh, year, as an undergraduate, one of the figures that you study in depth is Karl Marx. Oh, so, <laughs> so many of my friends actually. Many a lot of those, r the lot of those kind of subversive guys are over there in the sociology and anthropology wing of the university. Yeah, I think, no, but know? I mean, we they didn't think outside right. the box. Yeah. But yeah, but we mm. didn't just study radicals like Marx. We yeah. also studied more conservative figures like Emil Durkheim uh -huh. and uh, Max Weber. Uh -huh. Uh, so the wa there is a more of more of a pluralism, and uh, you know there is a well established you know feminist tradition and so on and oh so yeah, forth. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was a breath of fresh air compared to my experience of economics. You know my my friends uh, who studied sociology always like to s talk about. Well, I'm not a true sociologist. They like to think of themselves as you know uh, being on the margins of a, the discipline or sort of. But for me, I mean, the w my sort of uh, comparison was to economics. Uh -huh. You know, sort of sociology seemed so to it was rather than fresh than air. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you could talk to something other than the boring old, uh, you know, line that we were given and everything over a beer or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and you did that work at Tacuni, as you said. Yeah. yeah. And did you study there? You're doing a master. You studying with a particular person in that. Well, my advisor uh, for my PhD was uh, Stanley Aronowitz. Oh, I know Stanley Aronowitz. Yeah. Well, give him the best. 
Okay. The, the end of work, I think he wrote, didn't he? Yeah, One he's, of his books, he's you know? very prolific. He's very interesting yeah. guy. Yeah. I like Stanley yeah. very yeah. much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You were in good hands with him. Give him. My best. I see he's still kicking it at the forum. He yeah. was one of the major speakers and everything. And he's inter He's willing to think uh, about things in a major, different kind of way, a, a wider tempo, which yeah. I think is called for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, that's all well said and everything like that. And we were both at the, uh, at the, uh, at the forum mm -hmm. this year. Were you at the forum last year at, uh, at Pace uh, when it was there? Yeah, I mean, did I you present then and everything? And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I I was on a one or two panels, probably talking about uh, Greece. It, Greece, of course, is um, a focal point of the global capitalist crisis the yeah, last few right, years. Yeah, right. So what's going on there? There is really always amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I'd yeah. love to talk about. Mm -hmm. But uh, did you? Uh, let's see. Sociology is pretty inclusive. Uh, did you get into uh, wider realms than that? Uh, like, did you become interested in astrophysics and uh, Big Bang and the beginning of the universe? And did you expand the the pattern recognizing between the various? Di I I've always t I'm not sure if I did on tape or not. You have to forgive me. I can't remember we said it. But I think academia is getting divided down. In my, I've been at it a long time. But it, that is getting divided down. It's like a divide and conquer kind of pro, uh, uh, exercise. They're getting everything so specialized out. Yeah. That yeah, somebody focuses on one part of reality, one small part of a subpart of a subpart of reality, rather than encouraging thinking about everything. Yeah. I propose to some of my colleagues they ought to have a department of everything and then make it all available and make it interesting and encourage systems thinking about everything i don't know that's thought if so facto absurd or useless because what's the purpose of the educational process and why do we have a situation where in order to get if i may w i introduced you to public access here this is a thing that was started by a grand man, a filmmaker uh, named George Stoney in an institutional way. And they've made it to where you can do television and you can produce it, like I said to you in a brief uh, introduction. You can make television that goes around the world and you don't have to ever think about money because the p costs are all met by payments from the cable industry, capital and operating costs. So you don't have to think about money. And that if you can do anything at all without thinking about gain or money, it seems ipso facto absurd to even bother. If you understand what I'm saying, it's been so corrupted. So they come in and they get so specialized out on something that's going to, like your advisor, don't be looking at this Marx thing or something, you know, nothing outside the realm. And I, you, you want to get a certificate that's going to give you the ability to get a job where you can make some money. That seems to be the main thing on the minds. That's what George Stoney said about his students. They came, what do I have to do to get an A? I got to get into Harvard Business so I can make a lot of money. That the outer directed attitude rather than inner directed intellectual curiosity of youth is being stressed so much more and they're dividing and conquering the intellectual community about the understanding of the universe with the means by which understanding it comprehensively is becoming more and more available for real systems thinking across disciplinary lines to where you're interested in the whole the whole thing I don't know does that make any sense to you you you're in academia now yeah yeah I or think what do you think about well um, the pursuit of profit is a central principle to the capitalist economy it's what drives it forward has and that been characteristic of human society through all of history that the people who have the advantage are trying to get themselves in advantage they own the kings are all in the castle and the peasants are wandering around in the mud throughout all of human history more or less it's no. never been just yeah i mean you see i think one of the misconceptions okay, that good. um exists and that i often try to debunk in my classes mm -hmm. is this idea that you know the world has always been the way it is today in one way or another so you have different um, versions of this misconception right, right, right. so there is the conception misconception well you know humans are selfish by nature uh -huh. so we sort of look at the world around us today 
capitalism encourages people to be self-interested, yeah. competitive, aggressive, mm -hmm. so we project backwards. Mm -hmm. Or another version of the misconception is that, you know, there have always been inequalities between people, there will always be inequalities between people. Right. And if you look at actual yeah. the, the history of the human species yeah. on this planet, uh -huh. For the vast majority of our time on this planet, mm -hmm. we lived in hunting and gathering societies I know. that were actually egalitarian. Well, that's a, some Ashley Montague wrote well on that about, and also about the the nuclear family. You know, they had such a long gestation that yeah. it was almost certainly you could almost intuit that mm -hmm. there had to have been a cooperative order for that to have survived. You know. Yeah, and I mean, uh, so what? Um, the experience of the hunters and gatherers tells me is that, you know, there is no such thing as human nature. What makes sense, what the kind of, uh, the way people are partly, you know, can be explained by the conditions they live in. Yes, so right, right, right. So, for example, you know, hunting, hunters and gatherers l lived a nomadic existence, mm -hmm. so they were not interested in accumulating material wealth for the simple reason that they would have to carry it around. So for them, wealth literally was a burden. They were they were concerned. I just happened to watch it. Came on T Turner Classic Film, mm -hmm. the uh, Earth, Ode the the Space Odyssey film, Kubrick, uh -huh. and they had images of what like Australopithecine or something there on the plains of Serengeti or something. They were very concerned with surviving, and and not being killed by the cats that had mm -hmm. tremendous. Uh, ca uh, they were like prey, mm -hmm. hovering. Mm -hmm. nervous mm -hmm. about that because they the cats were able to run them down and eat them with regularity mm -hmm. so i don't think it was probably some pristine beautiful kind of a uh, setting of cooperation that we might want to think i bet it was pretty brutish at times and nature isn't just all uh buttercups and lilacs you know uh, well, but it's, it, every creature is interested everything's eating everything else in terms of uh the the ecology including uh, humanity was part of that order. Well, I mean, the natural risks even today, so, you know, yeah. the hurricanes or whatever, so, um, but, I mean, they had to, perhaps, uh, their relationship to tigers were not cooperative, but their relationship <laughs> was <wasn't other>. cooperative <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah, their the tiger would eat them. But, 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 but when we talk about social relations, we're yeah, talking okay. about relations between people. Yeah, right. So, yeah, so yeah. I don't want to idealize yeah, right. That's hunting what I was saying and too, gathering yeah. societies. Yeah. And it's true that in some of the literature, there has been a tendency to idealize hunting and gathering societies. Uh, there is... Um, a famous essay which I, I actually use but also critique in my book, yeah. which is called um, uh, The Original Affluent Society. So this oh, is by anthropologist yeah. Marshall yeah. Sullins, uh -huh, um, uh -huh. who basically argued that uh, hunters and gatherers were an affluent because they were able to easily meet their needs, not by having very advanced technology and um, a very a great productive potential, mm -hmm. but by basically keeping the material needs to a minimum. Uh, well, that's an interesting thing. Cervantes was once said, it's an interesting question. He said, there are two classes, you know, that's an overworked term, but two classes in the world, essentially, the haves and the have-nots. And do we give serious attention to ever inter interpreting what does it mean to be a have in total terms? Uh, Marx said, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. So you're talking about need as opposed to wants or to progress or to knowledge or to things that are available to us of intellectual understanding that couldn't have been available to somebody uh, a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. That there's some progress being made toward what are the goods of civilization. Uh, and so that there's some progress made, and it's not just bare needs that are needed. And I wonder, do you think there's ever a point where there might be a point where we transcend? Your book has the title Scarcity, Dealing With It, Rethinking It, uh, that we may transcend mat in terms of our capability. There's a capability or an ontology that we have that we've inherited out of history 
that may be changing in these very times that we live in terms of the percentage of the world population that can be realistically seen to be a have in the fullest sense of the word, not in the limited sense, or you know, there's enough turnips or there's enough something or other, but a uh, fuller sense of the word in a unique way that makes this time uh, different than all of history. When we get to a point where the technology now seems to be since about 1970 in the extension of power and so forth, it always seems to have been the major way in which a political system was set up, despite all the PR and things, was whoever had the biggest club would hit somebody else on the head, establish a political order because they had the soldiers and the public relations and the creation story that could establish, but, but it was essentially a military, realpolitik is the basis of political authority or political legitimacy. And those weapon systems that enforce that now have become finally since about 1970 species lethal, mm -hmm. which they have never been, even yeah. in the Cuban Missile. So the, the point being is, this may be a unique moment in evolutionary terms, not just political terms, in terms of the qualitative transformation that's taking place of this planet as a system in universe. I, I don't know, that's a lot of roundabout thinking, but. Yeah, I mean, there were many questions that are implicitly raised in what you, you just said. But um, yeah, th my book is, um, uh, treats many of those themes because um, uh, it is partly a critique of, uh, as I said, neoclassical economics, and yeah. the concept of scarcity is central to neoclassical economics. Mm. And it is also central to uh, Marxist theory, which is a critique of capitalism. Yeah. Uh, and um, what neoclassical economics means by scarcity, and that's a definition that I accept, is uh -huh. that uh, s you have scarcity when people's material desires surpass what can be produced with the material resources and available in, so it, in that's a society. The desire is not just the need. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. Um, so, so in that sense, neoclassical economics mm. argues that mm. um, this has always been the case. That's their argument. This is the case today. Mm. And uh, it is because of this scarcity that we need to find a way of um, uh, using our resources the best way yeah. possible, yeah. so we don't waste them. Right, right, right. Now, mm -hmm. um, there is the Marxist, the traditional Marxist perspective on this is to say that, um, well, that sort of the Marxist tradition is um, is kind of complicated. But yes. one one sort of version of the Marxist uh, thesis would be to say that, well, m scarcity can be transcended with the technology we already have. And the reason we have scarcity in capitalism is because capitalism creates lots of artificial needs. And if we only focused on our re true needs as opposed to just mere wants mm -hmm. created by capitalism, mm -hmm. you know, a socialist society could easily use the technology we have to basically satisfy people's true needs and overcome scarcity. That's one way of seeing it. Tiny Tim used to say, could I have maybe another small little cup of gruel? That's all I need. The idea of need is you don't need much. Uh, a horse doesn't need many oats. Uh, need is very, can be very parsimonious in terms of ignoring the possibilities of progress in terms of, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Reasonable <coughs> wants that might go to wants that are liberating of the human spirit in a way that they never have been at a level of capability. We didn't have the capability of an internet a, a hundred years ago. You couldn't have an internet or the advantages of, in, do you understand what yeah, I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, I mean, my position on this, yeah, it's yeah. sort of my book offers an alternative to both these positions. Good, yeah, that's um, good, yeah. I mean, on the one hand, I criticize neoclassical economics because mm -hmm. my argument is that Unlike what neoclassical economics claims, yeah. capitalism does not lead to an efficient yeah. uh, sort of satisfaction of people's mm. needs. Right. And uh, I explain that in some detail. Yes. But um, uh, I also argue that I, I'm against this idea of um, uh, saying, of I don't have a, a theory, I don't believe in sort of uh, formulating a theory of human nature oh, yeah, that right. would uh, basically yeah. define what is a true need and what is not. Yeah, yeah. But as interesting as that might be. 
right. to and try. Yeah. 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 Uh, my, my argument is that different people may have different ideas yeah, right. about uh -huh. what it is to be human or right. what the ideal life or might the possibility be. of us coming into a new relationship in the university evolutionarily. We appeared 200,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. We've lived in a condition that we may be coming to the end of in terms of our relationship to the broader universe. I don't know if it punctuated equilibrium or some new relationship that's not been available to us by the effective exponentially increasing extension of consciousness is characteristic of us and we may be coming to a time of liberation from what James Joyce had Daedalus call a nightmare of mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, a, that's another way yeah. of seeing things astrophysically or in mm -hmm. terms of the evolution of this universe, uh, Gaia, James Lovelock in uh, mm -hmm. England or something, seeing things evolutionarily, not just politically, is which we hear in the news and so forth all the time. There may be a time of qualitative transformation, not quantitative transformation. The whole system is going through. It's what I'm suggesting maybe is the characteristic of the time in which we happen to have been born. Well, I think one of the transformations, which is also <coughs> I discuss in my book, mm. uh, has to do with um, the ecological crisis. That yes, is major. Changing yeah. the way we think about <coughs> those things. Yeah. Um, because, um, you know, my yeah. part of the optimism of um, uh, traditional Marxist thinking yeah. had to do with um, an inadequate uh, recognition of um, uh, externalities. Right, of yeah. <laughs> limits to, yeah. you know, increasing right. production, right. technological progress, and right. so. Hazel um, Henderson and so forth, and externalities they were considered. Yeah. All that pollution is an externality, doesn't get into the model at all. Well, I, I mean, the, the, the whole idea of yeah. externalities, mm. of course, ties in with uh, neoclassical yes, economics I as think well, the yeah. way they think about pollution, and that's also something I discuss um, yeah. uh, in the book. But right. um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so the ecological crisis uh, changes the way we think about things, and of course, um, and it may also be one of the reasons why we might have scarcity even in a liberated post-capitalist society, unlike what many Marxists may have argued in the past. So mm -hmm. to give you an example, yes, and this is something that is not um, uh, inconsistent with Marxist thinking. I yeah. mean, one of the things, Marx had a very nuanced view of capitalism, yeah. very dialectical. There were many mm -hmm. things about capitalism that he appreciated, yeah. both the technological dynamics, but also he, if you look in the Grundrisse, uh, he talks about how capitalism in some ways creates new wants for people, mm -hmm. and he, you know, sees that as an enrichment of people's wants and uh, as a positive development. So to give you an example, yeah. in a uh, post-capitalist, let's say, liberated society, yeah. people would have you would have, uh, you know, people around the world would have access to education. Yeah. So they would be more aware, for example, of all the cultural richness Thank and natural you. beauty that exists around the world. Absolutely. Those are the goods of civilization that are really worthwhile being, instead of having to stand on a line and do something surf-like on an assembly right. line to get material production, you can be concerned with the things that really matter, like art and science and learning and, and being able right. to realize their full potential yeah, but within, a, yeah. within a system. 100 trillion cells in a human organism, mm -hmm. every cell matters, every cell and all the cells are connected as a system. It'd no. be wonderful if everybody could reel their own inner given direction of being able to realize their full potential with the understand with, without having to be manipulated by the external uh, needs they have to do in order to just survive. But you see, this process though would also create new needs. So for well, example, going true. back to what I was new talking needs about. needs and wants. wants right, new needs and yeah. wants. But yeah. So you have now seven billion people, they all have access Heading to good nine, education. I think, yeah, yeah mm. whatever, yeah. you know, it will go up, yeah, right? Yeah. 10 to 11 billion. Oh, yeah. so, so you have a very large number of people. They are all aware of the, you know, cultural richness and natural beauty that can be found around the world. Yeah. So you will have more people uh -huh. who will want, for example, 
to travel around thank the world. Thank you, thank you. Or do right. the arts, or maybe maybe do some sculpting or some painting or music or something yeah. worthwhile. Well, I mean, the reason creative. You the know? reason I'm sort of focusing yeah. on traveling. Yeah, right. Is because unlike sort of writing poetry, yeah, traveling is resource intensive. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Good thought. That's yeah. that's how yeah, it relates right, to right. college. Right. right. That's true. There's a business so there model there. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, so if yeah. you if you sort of become fascinated with uh, you know African cultures yeah. and Chinese history, right. and uh, you want to experience the the beauty of the Grand Canyon. Yeah, right. I mean, this yeah. is very re resource intensive. Taking a plane or train or whatever. Yeah, right. So my point is yeah. that um, it's stimulus. You know, people. Yeah. You, yeah. you would expect that large numbers of people would want to travel a lot. Yeah, and of course, yeah. it would not be ecologically sustainable for 10 billion people to travel as much as they would like to travel. So well, you think not, maybe, you know, you don't think we have a... We're, it seems to me, Costas, you know, I'm young, older, right? Uh, and everything, but it seems to me like every day, every day there comes over the transom New breakthroughs in every field is going. There's something major going on. Breakthroughs in every field. Uh, things that weren't even think possible. We, 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 we do have the ability, for instance, to tackle the ecological problem. So you could have a, a liber... What would it mean to have a liberated humanity rather than an enslaved humanity that our institutions and are reified in our outdated institutions we've inherited out of 200,000 years 10,000 generations of human existence. A liberated event, like guys jamming. You want the tr trombone to play the best trombone he can play or something. Do you understand? Yeah. I mean, is that, is that, that's too idealistic, I guess, to think we could get everybody liberated to be able to realize their full potential rather than such truncated possibilities available to them because of the lack of our leadership to give institutions that makes possible an ontology or a new changing reality that simply has not been available to any of our ancestors up until just now. Well, I guess one of the things I'm trying to do mm -hmm. in my book is uh, I want to argue that uh, having a liberated humanity yeah. does not presuppose abolishing scarcity altogether. Okay, okay. So Let, that that'd be good to put those two things together. Is that possible? Uh, it, it, what it, no, it is to, to take... Could we get a measurement of, if I may, are you familiar with the Zeitgeist movement? Joseph, no. J Joseph, no. Joseph, uh, 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 Peter Joseph and all that? Are you familiar with Buckminster Fuller? Comprehensive thinkers, comprehensive thinkers who were thinking about these things in a very comprehensive way. And they, they he, he, Fuller has informed a great deal of it. It's sort of like, Galileo made a big change about the center of the universe business and everything. Messed up people's sense of identity. Terrible, terrible. Hieronymus Bosch paintings mm -hmm. that were just showing the, the, the trauma. They, they, they only let him off the hook about 12 years ago, the Catholic Church, for saying we weren't the center of the universe, the change. But uh, they, they, they get like that. And he, he, he did at one time part of a thing he was comprehensive. They made a decision. They said, what does it mean to be a have? What does it mean to be a have? They got a, a reading. How do you get at that? What does that mean? Some of these issues you have in your book. Is seen, and they got a, a thing where they, they came up with a chart that was a good guess of a lot of the intellectual leadership of the time in the 50s. And it was, what, you know, what percentage of the world population can be realistically seen to be a have through time? And that you have these exponential growths that come into the 20th century. 10% by the First World War, 20% by the second, hyperbolic, going to exponential. And we were going to cross the, they made a projection that we're going to cross the 50% mark in terms of the trending of world population against the ontology and the evolving capability. Nanotechnology was over the corner. Computer was all these kind of things. And they, they came to the conclusion we crossed the 50% mark around 1970. About the same time, the weapons became finally, after 200,000 years, species lethal. There was something major going on. The, I, I don't know. Uh, but you see, I think... Um, okay, maybe, yeah, anyway. So it's not just a political thing coming out of history. It's almost like a, 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 an ontology. It's, it's a new relationship in the universe that the consciousness is evolving to 
and we're coming into a new relationship that would be synergetic or resonatingly more than the sum of a liberated humanity will bring us in to where we will survive and cut to a new level rather than go 99% of all species have gone extinct. You know, it, what I'm trying to get at, it's a major period of qualitative transformation is what I'm trying to get at. And how do we get at it? He wanted to come up with the operating manual for Spaceship Earth. What are the realities of these things your book investigates? Habness, all of the, is scientifically understood, and up on the table of the decision makers, rather than just reifying the outdated institutions out of history, which we tend to do and still do politically and otherwise. I guess uh, uh, it's a design problem. Mm. Well, I mean, personally, I don't believe that history is a kind of uh, linear, that there is linear progress in history. I mean, the, uh, the future is open. And I think uh, it's synergetic. Behavior systems unpredicted by the sum of the parts. There's something resonatingly more than the sum of a, a maximally engaged system. It's resonant, and you can't know that. There's no absolutes within the context that you're developing within. Well, there are systems, but there is also agency. It's up okay, to yeah, us yeah. Uh, to act and to decide or yeah. to help decide what our future will be. Yeah. And um, of course, times of crisis like today are especially important because we can have a future that may involve uh, a nuclear holocaust or a Wait a minute. environmental With catastrophe. With all due respect, it's not a nuclear holocaust. It's the end of the Homo sapiens species. Couldn't do it in 1962. We came within a hair's breadth of destroying all civilization. There would have been a few scraggling human beings. That's something different than a duke winning out over another duke to take over some land in one part of Italy or something, which is history. But to understand what I'm saying, it's not, it, it's not your normal it's, uh, punctuated equilibrium. You get into, we're here 200,000 years. We come out of Homo erectus. They were here four, seven million years. And we came out, we got through the eye of the needle and created our species. We're at a point of coming to the end of 200,000 years of human experience which is, includes the extending of our consciousness into the environment to make the m environment other than in an Eden-like sense is the way most of the creatures encounter the environment. And when we were embedded in nature, we encountered it. it, it that's, I'm sorry, I'm just ranting on, but uh, I, I don't think this is just your normal time. I mean, I'm suggesting. Uh, yeah, and part and of it would be we've, we've got the... But at the same time, we also want to avoid the arrogance because people have, yeah, had, okay. have had this idea that this is not a normal time for yeah, the last I 200 I years. Guess, <laughs> I guess you're right, like Napoleon. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's go off to Moscow, yeah. guys. I mean, there have all been people Hitler, Hitler, yeah, many yeah, times yeah. in the yeah. past. Yeah, yeah you're, absolutely this, right. uh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. This idea that we are yeah. not... I, I think, uh, you know, yeah. perhaps capitalist modernity is... Uh, in a perpetual state of crisis yeah. that calls for important decisions. Yeah. And um, these important decisions involve great responsibility that yeah. makes people realize yeah, that this right. is an important time they live in. Absolutely. And that, you know, and, that yeah. it's, and in that context, it sort of makes sense for people to say, this is not just any other time. It's yeah. an important time. Right. I mean, uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I agree with you in many ways. We have major crises, uh, you know, that we are facing. First of all, we have the, uh, you know, the capitalist economic crisis yeah. we are oh. going through, the kind of struggles that will go on, the kind of how these struggles will res be resolved will have a great impact on how capitalism and human life shapes up in right. coming decades. And then we have uh, you know, an urgent ecological crisis. Yes. What we do today and in coming years will have a great effect on the ability of future generations to be able to meet their needs. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, um, and uh, I think uh, if we, I mean, if we follow the, the, the path of least resistance, mm. uh, which is dictated by capitalism and business mm -hmm. as usual, mm. uh, the results are probably going to be disastrous. And um, it is up to us to try to uh, struggle for uh, a liberated future. Yes. 
that is that may know. be available to us in a way that it never has been. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Uh, that that's the thing. Uh, is there some way that the system, like the left or the right or the 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 the, 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 the system in place? Well, Bill Shakespeare, William <laughs> Bill William Shakespeare had uh, him say at Agincourt, you know, we have to hoist capitalism on its own petard. They are in the driver's seat in a certain sense. They're getting richer and the, ex the uh, concentration of the wealth is becoming just absurdly obscene now. It's worse than it was in 1789 France and so forth. But, how, but one of the things that, the, that we hoist them, it's so, you know, the, the capital instruments are creating the wealth. Robotization's coming exponential upon exponential now as well as just information technology. And so they're going to have, one of the things they're going to have to have, because that's displacing work or labor input to production, which is tremendously capable of producing good stuff and situations at an ontologic level, at a level reality. But one of the things they're going to need, people are going to have to have some way, even within their model, of being able to clear, having effective demand to be able to buy those vacations or those things that could reasonably be part of a fulfilled lifestyle to distribute income other than through labor. And much of the left in Marx, they are uh, hung up on the labor theory of value that the only way you're going to create anything that creates value is labor and capitalist congealed labor. So the left is going to have to be hoist on its own petard in terms of accepting outdated things that have to be done that maybe could include everybody in a system, left, right, and the ecology, in a way, and we, we have to find that, intellectuals have to find that, rather than arguing about who the bad guys are and who the good guys are, and so forth. The, yeah, we may be, that may be the design challenge at an intellectual level, and the political leadership, it should be up on the table of the political, there is enough. But, I mean, uh, uh, what I would say to that is that uh, many of the ecological and economic problems we're facing are inherent in the way capitalism works. Well, and um, I don't, it would be hard for the left and the right to sort of come together and, I and think agree it might on be an issue I think it might like be absolutely that. essential. I think it might be essential and to get out of the dialectic. You've got to have something to hoist not only the right on their petard, mostly it's going to be they've got to have some way of distributing effective demand. Well, I mean, this when is they don't need all the wage slate. The left has to get out of the swoon to the labor theory of value. And remember, people get their identities through what they do. And the system does work, doesn't it? But you see, the problem, I, I, I sort of agree with you that when capitalism creates too, too great uh, a degree of inequality, yeah. It may lead to a crisis of demand because people don't have the income to buy the stuff exactly that used right. by the capitalist machine. Yeah. And then, uh, but you cannot permanently suspend capitalism's contradictions by redistributing uh, income. Um, so, because for Not example, income, ownership of the capital instruments, the robot machines that are making the production, the ownership of that could be done in a private sector way that would be giving. A Laura Flanders on the left is beginning to talk about ownership. Ownership of a robot. If you own a robot, you get income. So instead of having the capital all formed in a way where it goes only to past savings and the people put up collateral and an investment is going to pay for itself, extend it to everybody as a way of forming capital to make available the good technologies that could be liberating and also the means by which the income is going to be distributed by something other than labor by a piece of, uh, let's say, ownership of a piece of technology that brings income to them. That's a way, that's, a, that's an approach that could be maybe identified rather than in, in caps, in, uh, enshrining the labor theory of value. That would be a critique of the left. Well, I'm not even talking about um, the labor theory of the You don't think that informs Marx? Or no, that I mean, that's part of the Marxist tradition. And the work ethic and all of that, you know? And remember, people get their identity by what they do, so you're messing with something that's really important, but it ought to be up on the table as being some... How are people going to get the money to make that wonderful trip to study the birds in the Amazon or whatever? And maybe they should be able to. Or how are they going to have the leisure to be able to play a saxophone really well or any of the goods of civilization? 
If uh, 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 oh, I'm sorry. I'm I mean, the question is, mm. how do you? I mean, uh, that's one of the important questions uh, the Marxist tradition raises. First of all, it provides an analysis of the contradictions of the capitalist economy. Mm -hmm. And um, it's true, part of that is the labor theory of value. But um, okay. I think even if you don't have a sort of uh, a traditional conception or uh, belief in the labor theory of value, you can still retain a lot of what Mar the Marxist tradition has to offer about, you know, capitalism and its Oh, uh, oh, okay, yeah, right, right, okay. tendencies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that's one thing. And so it provides an analysis and critique of capitalism, and it also makes us aware that um, you cannot, in order to achieve human liberation, you also have to talk about the need of uh, organizing Social and economic life in an alternative way. Yes, absolutely. Um, in my in my book, yeah. I offer the idea of economic democracy okay, as yeah. the alternative. Uh -huh. And uh, I mean, strictly speaking, the the way I talk about economic democracy, it's not a sort of a blueprint of what an alternative society yeah. would look yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In it's all its idea. details, yeah. it's more like uh, regulating regulative principle. It's a normative principle that yeah. says all human beings should have equal voice over the way the economy operates, mm -hmm. over the economic system on uh -huh. which their subsistence mm. depends. Yeah. And uh, this is not a utopian scheme to the extent that it is consistent with many practices that can already be found around the world. Yeah. Um, okay. Examples yeah. would include um, democratically run, yeah, democratically, the mask, yeah. democratically run uh, companies yeah. uh, or participatory budgeting. Yeah, because uh, you know yeah. uh, the government is also part of the economic life. Okay, it's an important, fair yeah, fair it's an important yeah. actor. Uh, yeah. actor. Yeah. Uh, economic democracy would require a fight against uh, patriarchy because the household itself yeah. is a is a setting where lots of economic functions take place, Absolutely. labor, and sure. so on and so sure, forth. Sure, sure, sure. So, so what I argue in my book is that mm. many of the problems with capitalism uh, have to do with the fact that capitalism is an undemocratic economic yeah. system. Right, and right. that capitalism is fundamentally inconsistent with the principle of democracy. Uh -huh. And that if we okay. want yeah. a society that is consistent with a human well-being mm -hmm. uh, and ecological sustainability, yeah. we also need to fight for an alternative way of organizing society, um, a way of society where the economic system is also democratically organized. Okay, that would be good. Have dem uh, economic democracy would be a re Yeah, I mentioned Madragon. That's a major thing in Basque. Kind of, that's a cooperative. The yeah. It seems to be spreading a great deal around. It seems to be getting a, a lot of legs, and there's some examples of that. And that's certainly something that we'd want to do. It gets into ethics and all kinds of other argumentation we brought up rather than just the neoclassical model <laughs> that you had to revolt against in a certain sense. Let's talk a little bit about the book. We're almost coming to the end and everything. The book, it with a full title, and uh, when did you put it together, and how can people get at it, I at the book and so forth, the book on scarcity, or your yeah. book? It's called uh, Remaking Scarcity from Remaking, mm. Remaking Scarcity mm. from Capitalist Inefficiency to Economic Democracy. Um, so, uh, it is. Uh, it was published in 2011 by Pluto Press, which okay, is Pluto, a yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. British publisher. Uh, has lots of great sort of uh, left-wing uh, books. It ha it's a yeah, and um, yeah, it is available. People can find it online. You know, mm -hmm. just Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Yeah, and so, uh -huh, and so uh -huh. forth. Uh -huh. um, and already, if you look at the title, yes, first of all, <laughs> I mean, remaking scarcity, mm. sort of, uh, a kind of, a sort of a challenging title because oftentimes we think of scarcity as a negative thing. That I mean, uh, it sort of it m it uh, has to do with the fact that I'm simultaneously criticizing both uh, mainstream economics and 
traditional Marxism. So with mainstream economics, scarcity is inevitable. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's, something, like an absolute, it's a yeah. given that you accept. You yeah, yeah, you cannot do well, anything it'd about it. So fact to absurd to said, and everybody can see there's not nearly enough. You know, I mean, that's what is the yeah. attitude of so much of the society. And my argument is oh. that people's experience of scarcity mm -hmm. is not um, s an external fact. That scarcity is not an external fact, but it is shaped by social forces. Seems to me we're trying to talk about that very issue. It's a huge issue that you're bringing yeah. up in the book. Yeah. Right? I mean, because uh, if uh, scarcity is about the relationship between people's wants and, uh, materi and the resources available, uh, we have to recognize that, um, you know, human wants are shaped by capitalism. Um, and we also have to recognize that um, the resources people have to meet their needs yeah. are also shaped by the logic of capitalist uh, society. It's uh -huh. not, uh, you know, a few people having everything and uh, the majority having nothing. It's that's not it, a fact of nature. It's the product of, uh, yeah. oh. of how capitalism works. That's so my mm -hmm. point is yeah. that you, we can remain yeah. scarcity. Uh, yeah. We and can remake it. That's yeah. the term, remake. And All right. right. To investigate the idea rather than just say it's ipso facto absurd to assume anything other than scarcity is ontologically part of the universe. Right. Which and it's also got to be questioned. Yeah. And it's also partly a challenge of the traditional Marxist idea, which yeah. is that liberation means the abolition of scarcity. Yeah. So I sort of. Well, okay, yeah. Uh -huh. so, I'm, uh, mm. so I'm saying scarcity can be remade yeah. in a post capitalist society in a way that scarcity is no longer an obstacle to uh -huh. human liberation uh -huh. and human fulfillment. Uh -huh. And um, the subtitle from capitalist inefficiency to economic democracy, yeah. again, it's like partially a commentary on mainstream economics, which claims that capitalism leads to an efficient use of scarce resources, uh -huh. the best possible use of resources so that there is no waste, and I challenge that in my book. Okay, uh, I argue yeah. that capitalism yeah. creates lots of problems yeah. uh, and uses Look resources yeah, yeah. in ways that create, uh, you know, ecological crisis and um, uh, a lot of waste. And uh, so it's uh, it challenges neoclassical <coughs> economics, yeah. and it, it argues uh, so. It argues that we have to move from capitalist inefficiency from the cap from the present where scarce resources are not efficiently used to an alternative, and the alternative is economic democracy. Okay, so I, I think you've t touched upon one of the most important questions of confronting mankind. I think I would suggest uh, uh, everybody in the audience go out and get this book and cotton on to this fellow. His name is Costas Panayotakis. And I thank you, Pop. Thank you. Some people have said that the, uh, or some people, particularly some of those Chicago guys, they say uh, economics is the allocation of scarce resources. That's it. And yeah. uh, the idea addressing that, I think you've addressed a major problem. And you're addressing it in a, in a way that's really important. There's a lot of things coming up around that scene. I thank you very much for such a very, very well-led life and for contributing to that. And it's your pleasure to have had his perceptions. We invite you to tune in. We'll be coming back on Conversations again, well, tomorrow with another program, but uh, uh, Costas, thank you very, very much for coming in and contribution to the left forum and to all your good work. Thank you for